once again, as it should be, yeah? Uh, 22nd of September, 2005, we open a show at the very same gallery where we just saw Christina's work. It was curated by Daniel Schwartz, a great Swiss photographer, uh, and a very dear friend who has been to Bangladesh for a long time. In fact, he's done a book on the Delta, which deals largely with the Bangladesh plains. There were several f known photo photographers known to me there. There's Shezad Nurani, whom I mentored in some ways, Zia Gafik, who was involved in the first World Press workshops where Pachala, through which Pachala started. He was at that time in Bosnia as a governor. Tim Hetherington, a very dear friend who taught at Pachala and uh, you know, his work we've shown. Uh, sadly, of course, he, he was killed in Libya. Um, the Nigerian photographer, Akin Bode, uh, and a name I didn't know at that time, Christina Nunez. Uh, I was asked by Daniel to write the intro to all the photographers, so I had, you know, I went through the work. It was very different from what we're seeing, but there were distinct similarities. She was working in the Italian catwalks, and the model shows, but as opposed to the sh images we are used to seeing in catwalks and fashion shows, what she did was strip away layers from that some of the pictures were, of course, of backs, uh, you know, behind the scenes of unwinding and other things. But she had a very interesting way of removing layers. And that, I think, is, relates in a very interesting way with the work that you're going to see. In the sense that we, we talk about portraiture as being a way to reveal characters of people, to, to get a better understanding of people. And in that sense, there are people who say, and I, I agree with that to a large extent, that a photograph tells as much about the photographer as it does about what is being photographed. And in that sense, every photograph we take is in some ways a self-portrait. If we were to look at a family album, we would through that get to see what that person feels about, what is important, histories of that person, the genealogy sometimes, and a whole lot of other things. At every level, what we photograph and what we do not photograph tell a lot about ourselves. And if you take that further, then the self-portrait is that much more revealing in terms of what you say, in terms of what you do not say. So this work that we're looking at, I find very interesting for that. For another reason, because often when we look at photography, when we talk about photography, we look at the product, the image, which what, what is in the frame, but also it, how it's presented in the context in which it is given to us, the way in which we interact. What is often not talked about is the process itself, the way the image was produced, what went behind it, uh, what stimulated it, why it was taken. Uh, and I think those are difficult things to get, get across, even in a photographic exhibition, and perhaps the best way to do it is to have the storyteller in person. That's what we have today. I present to you Christina Nunez. Thank you, Shahidul. And yeah, thank you for coming, for inviting me here. I'm really honored to be a part of this festival, which is really high quality, uh, probably the best festival in South Asia, right? <laughs> ah. <laughs> um, yeah, um, yeah well, this is fantastic. You know, usually, you know, I did all my work to be seen, you know, and a situation like this with all the eyes on me is just really fills my heart. So, yeah, so first of all, um, yeah, I was a documentary photographer. I used to be a documentary photographer and um, I stopped because I started, I had started documenting my life a uh, long time ago and little by little I started getting um, less and less interested in, um, in, in documentary photography as, as a way to, to, to tell uh, stories about the world. What I was interested in 
was the human inner life. So I was, uh, it's true that when I was a documentary photographer, I was uh, trying to, as you say, um, uh, pull out the layers. Um, but I wanted more. I wanted uh, a relationship with, with myself and with other people uh, really better and really uh, directly to the heart or to the soul, as you might say. Um, first of all, I will, uh, I will show you, I'll project my video, Someone to Love, uh, which is the story of my life. And then you will understand a little bit uh, all my work. Uh, as an introduction, and then I will I will uh, explain you uh, my method, uh, the method I teach, which is the self-portrait experience. Um, I'm a bit vulnerable right now, and and I, I work with vulnerability, uh, so it's fine. I can I can say it. You know, I'm I'm feeling I'm shaking. <laughs> so yeah, the, the looks of other people, it's it's fantastic, but of course it's uh, it's it's scary as well. Huh? Anyone wants to come over here? <laughs> okay, so I'll start by projecting you my video, which tells the story of my life, and, and then later I will explain uh, how I work with other people, because after a long time of working on myself, I started uh, inviting other people to do the same process uh, as I'm doing, and, and I feel that this has become a sort of mission, uh, because I'm you know, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, to convey the message that the vulnerability is the real strength. Okay, so here's the video. Yeah. Oh, no lights on me, <laughs> please. <laughs> okay. My father's family were high rank officials in the Spanish Navy at the beginning of the 20th century and during the Civil War and during Franco's dictatorship. I lately discovered that they were really close to Franco. In this picture there is my grandmother together with the dictator Franco and his wife. My granduncle Edmundo was a very charismatic gentleman. He was a friend of General Carrero Blanco, who was killed by an ETA bomb in 1973, which catapulted his car over a building. During World War II, he was known to have collaborated with the German Secret Service. My uncle Pepe was my father's elder brother. He had chosen the military career like his father, like me, Uncle Pepe, he needed to tell the family's story. He suggested me to go to Alono to search the family's roots, as far as 1500, I think, which I did. And I actually discovered six more generations of ancestors, which he didn't know. I also discovered that they were all Jewish. In 2007, I started to assemble diptychs and triptychs, putting together my self-portraits and the family pictures. I wanted to find a link with my ancestors. I wanted to mirror myself in what I rejected. I wanted to find the roots of my behavior and my actions. I took this self-portrait in 1995 in Mauthausen. I was there working on my book To Hell and Back about Jewish survivors to the Holocaust. I didn't know back then that we were Jewish. My great-grandfather Manolo was a very extravagant gentleman. He had his multiple portrait taken in a studio in Granada called Quintuplifoto. That was 1898. I love to create contrasts opposites. What might seem at first sight a provocation could actually be speaking about women, about the history of women, maybe suggesting that they had bodies like me as well. I'm the fifth of six sisters. When I was born, I had all the attention of my sisters, my mother, my father, my aunts. 
So I felt like a queen until my little sister was born. Then naturally all the attention went directly to her. And I started to feel an invisible child. I thought there was something wrong with me, that, that maybe I was unworthy of love. But maybe I just needed to be a protagonist. This need of protagonism at school caused me some trouble because kids went after me at school. They were making fun of me. The whole class did, running after me and calling me horrible names. Of course, my low self-esteem happened because I, I compared myself to my sisters who were so brilliant and beautiful and powerful. So I wanted to be like them, but I felt weak and unimportant, a piece of shit. Then in my teenage years, this feeling of inadequacy generated in rage. Then when I was 12, my parents separated, and then, of course, the, the house went into chaos, and, and I felt even less seen. I remember very well thinking, you see, I'm going to do something very important too. In the moment in which I was actually starting to do heroin with my boyfriend, Nasi. At the beginning, our drug addiction was fun. I used to dress up very quirky clothes. And I was empowered because I felt that I was doing something very dangerous and forbidden. I wore these clothes produced by myself or by my designer friends. And I was doing modeling as much as I could. I just wanted to show off. I think back then we were sort of pioneers in Barcelona because we were the only ones who looked and behaved outrageously. But we needed lots of money to buy heroin, so after a while we started trafficking and stealing. I proposed to go into prostitution. At first I went into a very classy club in Barcelona where I tried to find good-hearted clients to whom I could speak and tell my story and maybe avoid sex. But then I also remember the horrible clients who would get what they had paid for. My father once saw me with client walking down the street. I think that it was then that he sent me his ultimatum. He didn't want to see me anymore if I didn't stop drugs and that kind of life. I didn't realize it back then, but I think this sentence made me quit. So one day I called my sister and I asked her, I'm ready, so please help me. I went into rehab at Le Patriarch, first in Valencia, then Valladolid, Burgos, and then to France, because I was misbehaving. I didn't follow the rules. And then after France came Belgium, which was harder and harder. I was capricious, and this behavior provoked more severe reactions. Once they punished me by throwing me upside down in the septic tank. So I have actually swimmed into thick feces. The smell stayed on me for weeks. When I came back, my mother changed her attitude towards me completely. I think she, she seemed to really see me, and she became warm and affectionate. I lived with her while I was resuming my studies, and I was beginning psychotherapy. After a couple of years, uh, I met an Italian photographer. We fell in love, and so I moved to Milan, where I have spent my last 24 years. I was 24 and I was thrilled to start a new life in another country. I just loved how my partner used the camera to capture people's inner life and strength. So I picked the camera and then the first thing I did was to turn the lens to myself. So I took my very first self-portrait. It was 1988 in Los Angeles. I think I'd found a way to recreate that sort of gaze that I so much needed. But of course there was a lot of psychotherapeutic work to do to soothe my permanent inner pain and 
my uneasiness, being self-centered and very insecure. I was never relaxed with others. I didn't have my own friends. I only related to my partners. He was on stage and I was backstage almost unseen. I was very envious of his capacity to create images. And I was envious of his success, of course. I didn't have a profession of my own yet. I didn't have a way to show others what I felt I was worth. I became pregnant with Diana in 1990. For the first time I was content, happy, peaceful. Nothing really disturbed me. It was, it was a blessing. After some years of self-portraits, I started photographing other people. That was 1994. And at the same time, I was getting further away from my husband. We separated during my first project, Body and Soul, in which I photographed people naked, lying on my bed. It was the first time I could really see others and relate to them. I met a very handsome young boy from Bosnia. His name was Elvis. He had escaped the war. For the first time I could share my inner hell with someone else. We were distant, very far from each other. And we longed to be with each other every minute. He wrote me beautiful love letters from the army, but it didn't last long. We were too similar. It was as if we were in love with ourselves. For body and soul, I also portrayed my parents separately. But when I processed the negatives, I realized that they were lying in the same position. Their figures were perfectly symmetrical and their faces were opposite, the sun and the moon, their hands united. One day I decided to fast for five days. This is the last day. This self-portrait inspired me to work on my project Heaven on Earth, which is a sort of journey through European spirituality. For Heaven on Earth I went to Bosnia to photograph Muslim women. I had to wear the veil in the mosque, so I took another self-portrait. Two years later, I met a Senegalese man, and later on I gave birth to Yassin, who was actually baptized Muslim. So I continued taking self-portraits. Often it was a way to finish the role of film my dad died in 1998, and I felt devastated. Here I had dyed my hair blonde, and I didn't recognize myself on the mirror. In this self-portrait I was very ill, with high fever. I felt like dying, and I wanted to see what my face looked like. During 2004 I was very depressed and lonely. I photographed myself often and I realized that it made me feel good. Put myself in extreme situations also helped me to relieve my depression. Here I am in the Carrara Marvel Caves in, you know, that was February and it was minus five degrees centigrade. It was then that I realized that if I managed to express my despair in a picture it would be gone. So I built a method and started to teach in self-portrait workshops. I knew that if I wanted to express my best, I had to photograph my worst in a picture first. I started to work on family pictures to explore my relationship to my father. When I was a kid, I really longed for some contact with him. But he was distant. Instead, his best friend Antonio really cared for me. He used to sing me a song, asking my dad if he could marry me, and saying that I was the most beautiful of all sisters. This is how it was. Oh, señor Núñez, oh, escúcheme. Vengo a solicitarle 
la mano de su hija, la más linda de todas, la señorita Cristina Núñez. Everyone used to call me Gasparita. We were very similar. I had the same curly hair, the same nose, and the same thundering rage. In 2007, I took a self-portrait with my portrait of him to work on my relationship with him, even though he was dead. I started to write letters to him, thanking him for saving my life, but also complaining for the fact that he didn't talk to me. This is an accidental double exposure in which I had cancelled my daughter Diana. I was the kid, not her. I needed mothering. But ten years later, I think I became able to stay in the shadow and let her be the protagonist. This is my daughter Yasin, at three, just after coming back from Senegal, where she had spent three months with her dad and far away from me and her sister. Yasin asked me if she could take a self-portrait and she took this amazing series. She is not white like me and she's not black like her father. She probably needed to assert herself to express the contrast of her warm brown skin and the blue, cold European atmosphere. One day I took some pictures trying to photograph my rejection of her, my negative gaze. She can feel it. And a minute later, we can express our love and the tenderness of our relationship. Prem is my boyfriend. This picture, this incredible balance and strong union convinced me to get into a 30-year mortgage with him. We lived together in Gorgonzola for three years, but we ended up by hating each other. So I left and I moved back to Spain. Now he lives alone on top of a mountain and we see each other once in a while. In 2004, in a moment of deep distress, I had abandoned my dog Nero. I was penless and alone with two kids. So I couldn't cope with one more mouth to feed. One more being who was asking me for attention. Okay, so apart this good excuse, I've always felt guilty. So I took this self-portrait with a borrowed dog whose name is Bella. I wanted to work on my guilt and my loss. At the beginning, Bella was out of the picture. She was very hot, so she wouldn't lie on the paper background. But then when I started to weep, first pretending and then for real, she came near me. After working on my relationships, I would work on my place in the world, my role as a teacher involving people in the inner journey, my experience with Africans and in Africa my work with teenagers, and my role as a communicator to prove that the self-portrait is a great medicine for body and soul. Two or three years ago, when I was living with Prem, I was going through the happiest and most full time of my life. So I continued to work on my pain. I didn't want to forget about it. I discovered that I could always go back to my despair. It was always there, somewhere inside me, and it was time to let it all out. I woke up one morning and I was burning with rage against the whole world. I went down to the basement, to my studio, even before having a cup of tea. I didn't want the emotion to diminish, so I started beating the air with my fists to the left and to the right, until I felt completely knackered. Then I needed a new challenge. When I separated from Prem, I felt ugly, again, unlovable. So I took horrible pictures of myself and published them, because I knew that if I got used to seeing myself really ugly, I would become more free and therefore more beautiful. In the last few years, I used my method to work on my relationship to my mother. I used to despise her, to criticize her, and to pretend from her. 
Once I invited her to take a self-portrait with me and I later put that picture close to our old family picture. It was time to stop pretending from her and start taking care of her. Looking at her life story in the family album, I understood her inner struggle. She wanted to become an artist, a painter, but then when she got married, she had to quit. She was always an absent mother. She was always in her own world. I think she felt imprisoned. I think she has passed her creative spirit to me and to my sisters. I'm not saying that she was always unhappy. Some pictures showed that she had a good time too. That she and dad loved each other a lot for 23 years. In the last few years, she had several strokes, which caused her senile dementia. I recognized her less and less, and she often didn't know who I was. So I was very interested in exploring my new mother. She loved taking self-portraits, even at the hospital, just after a stroke. I love how she is expressing her increasing absent-mindedness. And at the same time, she's extremely present while she's taking the picture. She even started to like herself. Looking at this picture, she said, It seems I'm going somewhere, but I don't know where. I must say goodbye, but where do I begin? She also said, I'm building my own image. Her words were beyond senility and dementia, her higher self. When I moved to Barcelona last year, she came to live with me, which changed her state of mind. But maybe that was the evolution she had to go through. So she continued taking self-portraits in my studio. Here she is again. I see her expressing her openness and even enthusiasm for whatever might come next, maybe death. Since we couldn't really speak anymore, we took pictures together. We looked at each other's eyes for several minutes without speaking. I saw her as I had never seen her before. She was still so unknown to me, but this was fantastic. She was beautiful. Later on, her illness worsened, and I couldn't deal with it. So, in the end, my sisters and me decided to move her to a nursing home. We found a very good one, where caring professionals took really good care of her. And I saw her reach a state of inner peace. But then another series of strokes came, and she was taken to the hospital. The doctor said that she wouldn't last more than a week. Her heart was so swollen due to 60 years of high blood pressure that it actually occupied her whole chest. We took turns at the hospital. One of the nights I slept there, I brought the camera and I first started to photograph her. Then I gave her the cable release and she took a series of self-portraits. Then she took this amazing image. She was coming close to the camera as if wanting to communicate something and showing her strength in, in that difficult moment. After a couple of days she got a bit better, so they took her back to the residence. But then other strokes happened. I was there at the residence when she started her agony and I stayed there until the very end. I was stunned to see her last breath. She had been so weak and helpless, but her last breath was powerful, so determined. It was as if she was saying, okay, I'm going now meaning I decide when to go. 
It was something like that. <gasps> and now she's gone. And it's weird not to have any parents anymore. In a way, I feel, I feel them both in me. I feel more emotionally stable, more secure, which is rather strange for me to say. Okay. So as you saw on the video, it was my daughter Yasin who actually taught me that the self-portrait could be also very useful for others. I was amazed because she, she asked me if she could take a self-portrait and she was three. So, so then I started to study what was it in the self-portrait that made me feel good that made me feel okay with myself, and, and that made her produce such amazing images. I later started to invite other people to take self-portraits with my camera. That was 2005. Now, this little kid, uh, Gabriel, he was three and a half back then, and he, he took a series of self-portraits in the same day. So you will see now four images. So you will see the evolution in, this, uh, in these four images, but it was one day, it was only one day. So in the first images, image, she, he's not looking at the camera. He seems to express his vulnerability, but again, the little hand is strong and saying yes, in a way, clicking. I was not there, huh? I left him alone with the camera. On the second picture, he can look into the camera now because if he ex expressed his vulnerability in the first one, then he can pass on to something else. And then he could look in the camera and really wanting to communicate something, maybe even with his little hand in his heart. And I say, empowered by those two images, he asked me if I, he could climb on a tree and take a self-portrait up on a tree. And then he took a last image to me, it looked as if three years have passed, not several hours. So to me, it looked as if standing before the, in front of the camera and, and clicking and saying yes to, to ourselves, it was a way, uh, in, uh, a way to, to empower yourself. He looked wiser and stronger. So I started to study, I started to make a research to understand why was the self-portrait so powerful. And I happened to see a, a very beautiful exhibition in London in the National Portrait Gallery. And there was the text by Anthony Bond, a curator uh, in Sydney, uh, who, who talked about the, 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 the tripal role of the self-portrait. So at the same time, in the moment we're taking a, a self-portrait, not a selfie, let's say. Later we can talk about the difference between the self-portrait and the selfie. But in the solemn moment of the self-portrait, we are, we are at the same time author, subject, and spectator. And each of these three roles makes a sort of statement, okay? The author says, I am the creator of this image. The subject says, I exist. Here I am. It's, it's a sort of a, um, affirmation of, of our own existence, which is what the selfie is as well. And the spectator says, I can look at myself and I can see myself deep inside. Plus, there is a dynamic between these three roles of relationships which triggers the creative process. 
uh, and, and, and allows our unconscious to speak with the language of art. So the creative process through the self-portrait uh, becomes really a, a, a very good ally, if not the best, um, to, to let go whatever our unconscious needs to, to express. Plus this experience of taking your self-portraits um, as I do it, so I call it the cavern. Uh, actually, in my, in, in, the, in my workshops, I build a studio with a black background. You will see that. Um, and I call that the cavern, sort of journey through the depths or our, of our identity. So we have, yeah, the, uh, the cavern, this experience of, of, of being author, subject, and spectator at, in the same instant. Then the looking at the pictures, not recognizing yourself. And then the choice of the work. What is the work? What is the, the creative process telling me? We know as photographers that the creative process in photography is really visible. Sometimes we have this sort of climax in which when we photograph, uh, photograph people, we see that at a certain point, right, there's, everything is perfect. All the faces are in the right position. So, and, and this we couldn't control. So photography is really great to see how the, pro, the creative process moves. Okay, so then we have the, the work, the artwork, um, which has, of course, several characteristics, huh? the, the, the good image. And this work uh, um, is meant to be shown to the public. It's not ours anymore, because when we produce art, and of course, I, I, I consider photography as art, um, when we produce art, it's meant to be given to, to others. And with the self-portrait, this is very powerful, because by sharing what, what uh, your, your emotions, in my case, your emotions and, and your, your, your hardship with others, um, it's just not yours anymore. You're sharing it with the public so that they can use it. And, and in a way, it's a sort of union with the others, which to me, it was um, great, because I felt lonely. Uh, I felt lonely, and in a way, expressing uh, through photography or through this video, my life and my hardship, um, I received all these emails or, or um, feedback, uh, really warm feedback. So it was a way of, of, of really, uh, I call it usually that I try to transform shit into diamonds. Um, why? Because uh, then your shit, let's call it, uh, is useful also for others because other people might see themselves in it. Okay, so in, in 2008, I started to set up the studio, what I call the cavern. And in this studio, I was inviting people to, to express their more, di more difficult emotions. I started with rage and despair, so extreme anger and extreme sadness. And I had uh, Gabriele as well, another similar name. Uh, Gabriele, who uh, I, had, I had taken some portraits of him for, for quite a long time, because he he was um, he he was a um, a transvestite. Uh, he he was a transgender. Okay, he he wanted to become a woman, and he had been taken uh, taken um, hormones to to become a woman. So his voice was changing, his his body was changing, and I was photographing him this this change. But at a certain point, he disappeared. Um, and I also wasn't really convinced of, of, this, uh, uh, of this story, also photographically. So, yeah, he disappeared. And after one year, he called me. And um, I, I heard already that his voice was changed. So, and he told me, uh, I said, well, let's meet. And he said, well, you'll be surprised. <clears throat> and I knew, I knew that he had decided to get back again to, to be a man. So he came, uh, he came to my place and he took a series of self-portraits. This was the best, uh, and uh, with, a, with a big difference from the others. Um, what I didn't say about his life is that his, uh, his, his big pain was the fact that he, he had never been in love, and he had never been loved by someone. 
so so he 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 had this as as a really as a weight uh, and uh, because he had all this identity he didn't even know who he liked you know so he, it was hard for him and i think that this happens to uh, most transsexuals that uh, in their teenage years they can't uh, really establish um, satisfactory relationships so he took this self portrait and um a friend of mine saw it and he said, this looks like Caravaggio, uh, which actually surprised me because um, my studio then was in a place called Gorgonzola in Italy, close to Milan, which is very close to uh, a village called Caravaggio, which is where uh, Caravaggio was born. And uh, this friend of mine told me, you know, this really looks like painting um, a boy bitten by a lizard, which is this painting. I saw the thing and, well, at the beginning, I didn't really see a similarity. I mean, Gabriele was very much similar to the Caravaggio characters, but the thing is that, well, that stayed in my mind. And one day in London, I went to the National Gallery and I saw the image, I saw the, the painting, one of the two paintings. Um, and I read what was written close to the painting and it says that it was an allegory for the lack of love. This really struck me because in a way uh, I knew that by inviting people to, to work on their pain and on their deep emotions, I was, uh, you know, I, I had the feeling that we were touching uh, something universal, uh, something so deep that it would be expressing something of the area where, where we were. So in a way, that was the first time in which I, I understood that with this journey into our cavern, we can actually express uh, or, or, or become iconic. Salvatore uh, was in a community uh, for people with terminal AIDS. Um, he was there um, really very ill and actually he died six months after this picture. And he took this uh, this self-portrait, that was the very first time that I was asking people to, to, uh, to perform a silent scream. And when he did this image, um, and he told me that he's from Pompeii. Pompeii, uh, you know, there was these, all these carnized bodies in which uh, the, the volcano, when the volcano exploded, the lava uh, killed um, thousands of people. These are the carnized bodies in Pompeii. So in a way, he was also managing to express his own roots. Emanuele, he's a curator from Milan, and um, he did the self-portrait. Uh, at the beginning, he was worried because he didn't like his tummy. He used to be very slim, so he was worried that, you know, that his tummy would show. And, and when, when he saw the pictures, he didn't really know that I was, uh, the frame was a bit big, you know. So when he saw the pictures, he said, no, no, because the pictures were done in a gallery and the pictures were supposed to be projected in the gallery right afterwards. So he was really worried and saying, please cut the picture, cut it here, you know? cut it, cut it. And I said, listen, I mean, you were brave enough to come here and uh, I mean, this tummy, can you see this? Uh, this, this makes you look like the Christ, you know, for, for, uh, you know, for us in, in Europe and <laughs> Italy and Spain, this is very important uh, to look like the Christ. So, so in a way, when, when I told him this, look, we looked at in the internet at images of the Christ with his uh, wound in the, in, the, in the right side, so then he accepted to show his image. <laughs> Petri, Petri is a Finnish photographer, and he's, he's been uh, suffering from psoriasis, you know, the, the skin disease, for 25 years. And he had never photographed himself. So he's a photographer, but never ever photographed himself, not even a selfie. But when he heard my presentation, decided that that was the moment. It's true that in that moment he was taking heavy medicine to, to avoid, you know, looking and, and to avoid the, the, the actually the, the uh, how do you say, 
the maximum moment of the Triazis. Um, so he wasn't looking too bad. But anyway, he was, he was photographing his own pain. All these 25 years of, as he said, of, of picking up pieces of skin from the floor, of, of washing bloody sheets, okay. So he was photographing that and he was feeling the camera looking at him. And then he becomes, he sat because the, 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 the frame was vertical. And he, then he decided to sit. I didn't tell him to sit. But then suddenly we saw the pictures and he, I said, well, this is the Buddha. You know? So through the pain, through the pain, we are in contact with what I call our higher self. So in, in a way, my aim and with, uh, which is what I've done with myself, is to prove that every single one of us has a sort of divine part, uh, has a sort of higher self, which is absolutely perfect. And through this pain, we can express this. Carla was a woman in turn in San Vittore prison in Milan. She was the, the, the most marginated among the marginated because uh, she, was, she was a rebel. She was always mm, complaining, screaming, and even all the other uh, interns didn't like her. So actually half workshop, she was taken to a, a punitive prison, so, so she couldn't go on. And the workshop went mm, along for, for several months. And at the end of the workshop with the women interns, she was not there anymore, we were building a little book of the work that we have been doing. And, and um, I was surprised that all the interns chose this image as the cover of the book because they didn't like her. So I was really surprised. And I, I started to think and I, th I understood, well, that's my theory, that's my hypothesis, I don't know. But first of all, there was this hood um, this hood uh, that made her sort of sacred. Um, and then there was the fist on her chest. And the fist on her chest in a Catholic country means mea culpa. It's, it's sort of an assumption of, of responsibility, which is something that the I women interns in that prison couldn't do because they were in a preventive prison. They were waiting for their trial. So if you're waiting for your trial, even the lawyers w are going to tell you not to not admit your guilt. So, since the human being is perfect, as I say, then she needed to admit the guilt, they needed to admit the guilt, so they chose that picture. That's my theory. Okay. One can say, well, maybe it was uh, casual. Now, you're going to see a sequence. Uh, this, uh, um, Vera is, a, uh, is an artist, a Finnish artist in Finland. And you're going to see how the, the self-portrait uh, session works, because uh, in the first three images, I think I have four, um, in the first three images you will see her doing the emotions exercise as I, uh, following my instructions, so I asked, that I asked her to choose between rage and despair and try to first pretending but then listening to herself um, in order to, to, to let the despair or the rage go. Okay, so she was doing this exercise here, and here, and here. And then suddenly, because the, the, um, the cable release, at a certain point I was asking them to, to switch off the time, uh, to switch on the timer. So they, wouldn't, they won't have it on, a, on their hands. So the, on the next picture, the, her hands were free. It seems another person. So this is what I call the higher self. This picture, she, she wanted to delete it because her eyes were not looking good. But look at the hands. And suddenly, she, here she's a young woman taking pictures and here she's like goddess. And then there's the hand, which reminded me of, of uh, Giovanni Battista so John the Baptist by, by Da Vinci, and also the Venus of Botticelli. Now you're going to see another sequence by Andrea, and I'm going to ask you to choose which is the best picture. So, uh, I think there are three. One, two, three. 
Okay. Wait. Uh, just choose. Everybody uh, concentrated in choosing. <laughs> and. Okay. Someone votes for. They say yes. Huh? Someone votes for the first one. Yeah? Okay. The second one? Yeah? Okay. The third one? <laughs> okay. Maybe you saw it in my blog. <laughs> okay. Why? Why is that? Why is it the best picture? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's like he's really gone into the this journey, this inner journey. Yeah? Whereas here, he's still like acting. Because in fact, the self-portrait is, is a performance. Yeah? It is a performance. But with my instructions and maybe with the timer, um, people always, in fact, there is a very high rate of success much higher than when I was uh, there in the studio taking portraits. So um, when I leave the people alone to take pictures, for sure there's going to be a powerful image, always. Huh? This is incredible. So I'm getting what I really wanted. I really wanted that inner life. So, so it's there. Okay, now, sorry, I'd like to, because I can see, I want to show here how can I show half of her face? Move it. How can, with three fingers? Ah, great, great. Okay. Okay. This is how we work on the images. Oh, okay. Okay. So, this is our emotional side. Hmm? What do you see here? What emotions? Uh, thoughts. What, is, what, what do you think she's thinking, feeling, or expressing? What emotions or thoughts? Loss. She's lost or a loss? She's lost. Okay. What else? No, I think they said loss. Loss. Okay. Yeah, that sounds. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the responses are are correct, because our per perception is subjective. So, everything that you will say is is part of. You know, we're not going to decide what's uh, the right answer. What emotions or thoughts? Loss. She's lost or a loss? She's lost. Okay, what else? No, I think they said loss. Loss. Okay, yeah, that sounds... Mm -hmm. I mean, all the responses are, are correct. Because our per perception is subjective. So, everything that you will say is, is part of... You know, we're not going to decide what's uh, the right answer. That's, that's what's interesting. There are people who see one thing and there are other people who see something completely different. There are people in my workshop below, come on. Say, what do you see? Huh? Self-realization. Wow, fantastic. It's the first time that anybody saw something like that in this uh, in the image. Self-realization. What else? Disappointment. Madness, disappointment. Madness and disappointment. Madness. Okay. What else? Worried. 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 Okay. Helpless. Helpless. What 
what does she seem to think? What do you think she's thinking? Confused, yeah, but a sentence, a thought. Memories. Past. And it's good memories or bad memories? A wasted life. A wasted life. Wow. Relief. Sense of relief. Wow. Yeah, okay. <coughs> and here, what's the difference? Uh -huh. It's a, I promise there's no Photoshop here. It's the same photograph. What's the difference? Yeah. There's less pain. I mean, nobody said pain in the other picture, in the other side of the face, but hope. So, okay. Clarity. Ready for something. So, aren't we seeing completely opposite things than what we saw on the other side? So that's the perfection of the human being. We have, we can have this vulnerability because in fact, this is the side of the emotions. It's the side of the vulnerability. It's the side of the introspection. It's the side, it's more feminine side, or let's say of the inner mother. And it's the side of the past. Whereas this side is the side of the mind of the thought. It's a side of uh, our goal in life, our goals, yeah? and the strategy to get what we want. So it's a side of the future. And it's also the more masculine side, or the side of our inner father. So we have, always we have the same, you know, <laughs> we have the two sides at the same time. So we have this huge potential, and, and this is necessary. So we, we are used to see, um, I, I, was, I, I used to, to be an advertising photographer, and when I worked in advertising, several times the client asked me to clone this eye, which was less emotional and so less uncomfortable, to clone it and to put it here as well. So the emotions won't be there, because the emotions, if you want to sell a product, they are uncomfortable. So, you know, you had to cancel that and make a, a, a symmetrical face, which is, sorry, bullshit. We don't have a symmetrical face. And we do have emotions, so, so why not be real and, and show what, what we are? That's the whole point. Here, uh, it was Palermo. Um, a workshop for, for educators of, of the uh, service for drug addiction. And here, uh, it, it was my first workshop in Palermo and uh, I wasn't surprised to see that the fear, um, the terror, one might say, could appear in a place where um, most of the people are um, forced to, to see, to hear, and sometimes to live uh, what the Mafia does. And these are all a series of, of self-portraits that some of my particip participants of my workshop have taken in my studio. A Finnish artist, An Italian photographer. Another man with terminal AIDS in the same community as Salvatore, which you heard below uh, before. At a school in Finland. Canada, Montreal. 
Luxembourg. In prison, I, I work on in prison as 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 I told you before uh, uh, since uh, 2009, and now I'm working in Spain in prison every year with a project for men or for women. So now you're going to see. Uh, now this picture, in this picture, who does he look like? Mona Lisa, fantastic. Nan Golding, fantastic. <laughs> Great. The hair is fantastic, and the hair made me think of those white wigs of the of uh, King Louis XIV. Huh? So she's sort of regal, you say regal, huh? a regal posture, but she's in prison, and she will be in prison for the next ten years. And that's the men prison where last year I did a, a long workshop. In my workshops in prison, I try to do longer workshops so that I can follow their evolution. And the sharing of this expression of emotions is incredibly powerful. Just to tell you that with this picture, actually, we, we had a discussion about racism because when, it, when they came to, to the group uh, sessions, they would sit the whites here on the one side and the non-white or black on the other side. And of course, you notice right away. And then this picture came out and they were seeing things. What do you see here? What emotions? What attitude? What does it seem? And so on. And at a certain point, I said, well, this is a black man, because nobody had said black, okay. This is a black man, and, and he's naked, so he could be in the 18th century. Or he could be telling us, do you realize what being black means? That we carry the weight of so many millions of slaves, okay? He's in a white country, so he could be telling this and representing those millions of slaves. And then after this talk, um, or during this talk, actually, one of the white guys, he was very, really very nice person with everybody. He, he told this guy, would you like to be white? <laughs> and, and this guy, Demba, his name was Demba, this guy said, said rose from his chair and he said the other was a bit scared and he said if my child I don't know, because uh, sorry the question he said do you, would you like to be white because you know michael jackson and so on and and the guy said if my son once tried to become white i would kill him you know and then he sat down now from then on Incredibly enough, they came into the group and they mixed. So they were not sitting, you know, it, it was incredible. And they kept sharing, they kept sharing their, their emotions, their family pictures, their, and making their projects. Yeah, you, yeah? do you know, <laughs> do you know what this means? to be in prison, you know? So, so yeah, that's, that's it. Thank you. Uh, maybe you want to make uh, some questions, right? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm usually a, a, a good speaker, but I, I'm not feeling very well, so I'm <laughs> sort of um, doing a strange um, talk. Um, not sure if I missed it. Hi. Um, thank you, by the way. Um, you had tantalized us with the theory of the selfie. Ah, that yes. I would very much like to okay, hear. Okay, okay, okay. 
Um, now the selfie is, as I said before, uh, is it, it proves that the people know that the self-portrait is empowering, okay, first of all. It proves that they know instinctively, eh? maybe unconsciously, that the self-portrait is an affirmation of our own existence. We have to think as well, and it's a parenthesis, that right now we are in the, in the moment of most loneliness of all times. Why? Because each one of us has to uh, decide what to make of your own life, and nobody can help you to decide what to make of your own life. Okay. Of course, I'm talking more about my culture and the West. So, like in the in the 70s and the 60s, let's say before 60, 1968, in the 60s, um, you could do what your father was doing, and and nobody would you know would look at you strange. But right now, we are so bombarded with models of success of any kind, of people who have believed in what they do and they have had success, that you know, young people find, you know, you go out of, you have to decide what to study and you don't know what to do, you know, but you, you are, you have this pressure that you have to decide to do with your life, but, but nobody helps you to decide it, and then once you've decided, you have to make it, okay? So, so I think that this makes um, us lonelier than ever. That's a parenthesis. So, so in fact, right now, the self-portrait, and uh, the selfie, let's say, but also the self-portrait, uh, will help you to, 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 to assert, to affirm, uh, to state that you exist, okay? That you exist, and you, and you want to show that you exist to others, okay? And you want to publish it right away. So the selfie is a public image. It's right away a public image, okay? And it's right away sent to the, 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 the social networks, okay? But because it's a public image, we control it. Um, we control it because we want to show others that we exist, yeah, but we want to show others the image that we want of ourselves, uh, both, both uh, physically and as an attitude. Okay, we want to show our strength. And because the moment of the selfie or the self-portrait already is expressing some strength, so the selfie is perfect. But it's public image, only public image, and it's controlled. So in the selfie, uh, when you produce a selfie, there will be, it will be a lot of images that we will, you will delete, right? Okay, from now on, don't delete them. Why? Because, because you control the selfie, you're not going to see what the, what the creative process is telling you because you won't recognize yourself and you want to recognize yourself but I don't want to recognize myself because how, you know, it, otherwise I wouldn't be, have been able to, to see my million Christinas and the ones that are to come, okay? So I wouldn't be able to, to discover my whole potential and I would stick to that idea, but then whenever another picture, which is not like what I want, it's like horrible, okay? Well, that horrible, I have experienced in my workshops, often, especially with older women like me, you know, I say, oh, horrible, huh? these pictures are horrible. Okay, we make horrible images, right? But that horrible, I say, okay, we're not deleting it, we're j I'm just helping you and accompanying you to see the beauty. The beauty, not, not the beauty according to the market, uh, not the beauty according to the media, but the beauty according to art. So the beauty then becomes an expression of what we really love, an expression of what's most important for us, an expression of our values. Uh? an expression of humanity, of sheer humanity. Okay, so, so what happens that those pictures that you delete, if you look at them, and, and I help you to look at them in this side and that side, only by just contemplating this picture, after five minutes, you will accept it. Okay, 
So all those horrible pictures are fantastic opportunities, you know, to gain more self-acceptance, to be more, more stronger and wiser. So promise, you won't delete them anymore. You know. And then, okay, I was, I lose myself in a million of uh, parentheses. Um, so it's a public image and it's controlled, the selfie. Um, the self-portrait, as I propose it, it's not controlled. So I just facilitate the situation in order that the creative process will express whatever my unconscious needs to express so that, you know, I will be liberated of whatever needed to be expressed. And then I will look at this, at this image. I won't recognize myself. Maybe it will be scary. Maybe it will be horrible. But then, little by little, I learn something more of myself. And I see the beauty of my humanity, you know. So, so then the self-portrait, it becomes, it's not a public image. It's an, a, a, an inner dialogue within myself. Allowing myself to let out all my horrible shit, <laughs> you know, when I consider my shit, which then becomes diamonds, of course. And to see it, you know, and to suffer from it, maybe. But then to find, because it's a perfect image, of course, I'm not going to, to work on the images that are not artistically perfect according to my criteria. So I'm going to choose those images that seem perfect, that I don't want to change anything, that have incredible shapes. You remember Gabriele, the transsexual? Huh? So it, it, this shape, I wasn't there. I wasn't there to tell him, stop, this is fantastic shape. He did it. But it's not he, he didn't do it. It was the creative process and his unconscious, which are big alleys. And just then, this, this creative process was triggered and an incredible perfect image came out. And this perfect image has a lot to say, has a lot to, to teach me, okay? So, so then, the, this inner dialogue is a sort of, helps us to liberate um, all parts of ourselves. Um, in 2012, two of my sisters died of cancer. And uh, so I could experience what, what cancer is and what cancer uh, meant to them, in, in their case. But I felt that they had a lot of things that they didn't want to see, that they didn't want to acknowledge, that they didn't want to accept. I think that it's related to that. Of course, it's only a theory. I'm not a, a, a doctor or a researcher, but I have the feeling that, that you know, that. We are supposed to, we're here to learn and to grow. We're not here to just lead a nice life and we're here to fight. So how can we evolve if we, if we don't, uh, if we don't you know, yeah, acknowledge our vulnerability and all our shit? You know? I hope that that answered the question. <laughs> Sorry if I was too long. Any other question? Yeah? I don't know if I'm, it's too long, I'm, I've taken two hours or what? So I, I, wanted, I was just curious how you decided you wanted to work with incarcerated individuals and what has been the impact on those prisoners once they've gone back on other prisoners? Yeah. Okay, I work in prison because I've been lucky enough not to be in prison. I could have been in prison. So I think that when one is lucky, you have to give back your luck. So, and I'm also very attracted to what's extreme. So I don't take drugs anymore since a long time ago. So I have to do something extreme because then I feel great. Because inside, inside we, we are these extremes. I think that the, uh, in the, the human inner life is full of, of extremes. So in order to, to um, I feel great, and it's so beautiful to, because it's, they're so, they're so uh, grateful and so interested, you know? I think that when people are, you know, touching the bottom, um, they're not so afraid to face 
their shit because they're already in deep shit. So, and when I go there and I tell them my story, right away there is this silence and this uh, and this um, sharing. And um, less than one month ago, I was there uh, in in men's prison because I'm starting a new project in prison. And I did my presentation, and I told them that um, people who have gone into deep shit and uh, managed to get out of deep shit and overcome uh, and rebuild their lives, these people have a great potential of helping others. Okay, this, this was the concept, and one of I was in the module of violent crimes. One of them um, told me, yeah, you have told us your life, and I can understand that you can help people, but can you tell me how can I help others, um, taking into account that I have killed a man? How can I help my child by telling him that I have killed a man? His question left me wordless. And after a small while, I, I said, well, you are helping me with your question. Because it's the first time that I'm talking to someone who has killed a man and who is telling me that he has killed a man. Because normally in prison, I never ask others their, their crime. So in the end, he joined the workshop. And uh, well, I still haven't started, so uh, I'll publish that on my blog. But anyhow, in, uh, to, res to answer your question, what I have seen is that people, first of all, they start learning how to, uh, how to um, perceive pictures in depth. And, and this, this exercise that we've done, uh, the looking at the emotional side and the, and the rational side, um, really was fascinating for them because they started to see themselves and to see others in a different way. First of all, they started to, to see their potential and to see that, you know, to go beyond the labels, okay? Of course, this is no magic wand, you know? So um, I'm trying now to follow up some of the people that have done workshops with me. I don't have still enough, like, research. I'm collaborating with a university that can help me to do this research. But what I, uh, their feedback, I always ask for their feedback at the end of the, of the journey. And their feedback is always, yeah, I have learned to see myself in, in, from a new point of view. That's the most common. Or, for example, I, um, I'm more confident with others, for example, because I've shared something. And that seeing my, my, um, my fellow prisoner crying in the picture changed completely my, 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 my view of him. So we started to talk and we started to share. So I think that it's um, going down to a sheer humanity, maybe extreme, surely uncomfortable. I know that what I'm saying, everything what I'm saying is uncomfortable because this society doesn't, uh, doesn't put enough attention on, on the human inner life. So, so in a way, by going down to the basic sheer humanity, then relationships become more human, more, you know, you can, you know, you can find a good part in everyone. So I think that more or less could be this. But the objectives of the method are to involve prisoners in the creative process, help them to transform their shit into diamonds or their emotions into art to trigger the creative process to learn that they are they have the right to let out their emotions you know and that this won't label label them further you know and and to and to learn how to how to see themselves i think that this of course you know i wish i could you know give you statistics results i mean i'm on the way i hope that i will be able <laughs> in some years. I think that, yeah, thank you.